Well, hello there, uh, psychology class. I guess uh, some of you are embarking on a mission of trying to complete your midterm at the point in time at which I am actually doing this uh, highlighted review session. Just remind everybody of where we left off before we begin our next chapter, which is going to be chapter 7, but this is about chapter 6, consciousness. What we had uh, covered briefly uh, had to do with these learning goals, attention and its adaptive value, uh, dichotic listening, and uh, what happens when you engage in dichotic listening, and uh, certain kinds of disorders. We covered some of these things and a, a couple of others before we parted company before your uh, much-anticipated spring break. We have uh, certain kinds of selective uh, internal processes and functions, and, uh, and it's a good thing, actually, ultimately, because uh, if you had to process every single thing that was happening in terms of external stimuli coming into your uh, sensory system, uh, you'd probably, even as big a brain as uh, I know all of you have, you'd probably be on overload. So we have this uh, mechanism, uh, to some extent, that uh, prioritizes uh, the important bits and pieces of information we get from the outside environment. And uh, in a sense, it's a very, I suppose you might say, ergonomic. It makes uh, the best use of uh, the cognitive resources, which are limited, but they're nevertheless rather uh, in another respect, profoundly uh, abundant in our brains. In any case, uh, prioritizing allows us to focus on the most relevant information that, that is uh, appropriate for our survival. There was an the experiment called dichotic listening, and I simply mentioned it here so that you can uh, go back and take a, a look at it and see if you need to refresh your memory about it at some point in time. Uh, this is an idea that uh, involves the offering of different messages presented simultaneously to each year. Uh, repeat or shadow uh, the message and ignore the other. Uh, and for an unattended message, uh, we have the conclusion that uh, not that much is remembered, except that there is some processing that occurs. So if you've got uh, something going on in one side of your uh, uh, ear, or in one ear, and by definition one side of your brain, something else might be going on with the other ear, or some kind of background uh, notion. And we all discussed the cocktail party effect and uh, the idea of multitasking. So it's very, very interesting that we might have the multitasking. I'm, as I do this, uh, I'm multitasking right now, and evidently uh, that's a visual issue, and it's not going that well because you just saw a little pop-up come up with uh, you know a friend of ours named Maria. Isn't that interesting? So I had to try to get rid of it. All of a sudden, it occurs while you're trying to do a very interesting, you think, presentation, and then you get some little message uh, in uh, on your desktop. But in any case, uh, not that having been taken care of, we have something called the cocktail party effect, and uh, this is where you, uh, some of you are better at it than others, uh, have the ability to be able to listen to other things going on and maybe even uh, get bits and pieces of conversation. But in all likelihood, as you concentrate, you are not actually... Uh, picking up on two conversations simultaneously with equal focus. You're probably going to be missing something from one of them. And the lesson in dichotic learning has a tendency to uh, actually promote the idea that we can focus best on one thing at a time. The notion of automaticity was discussed, and uh, you know, the purpose of this presentation, by the way, is just simply to highlight, uh, you know, some of the things we discussed. I had made the promise, and I'm trying to keep to it, that I would uh, put some form of uh, instant review session up there that would be in an available format. This one will happen to be on YouTube. Um, what we do with automaticity is have a fast and uh, effortless uh, uh, audio processing that uh, doesn't require necessarily too much focused attention on our part. Uh, you probably notice things and pick up information unconsciously when automaticity occurs. So there are things going on in the background, uh, so to speak, and uh, your consciousness can bring them to the foreground uh, almost effortlessly. But as you are doing what I'm doing right here, for example, and that is uh, trying to produce a relatively meaningful overview of what we previously discussed, I am aware of some noises coming in through the window and appears to be gardeners uh, next door that are cleaning up the yard, mowing, and doing things like that. I'm somewhat oblivious to that unless I decide to go ahead and focus on it, or it gets my attention for some reason. We discussed a bit about subliminal influences, and uh, you can take a look at the 
uh, recording on that. I'm probably going to go ahead and put just a little bit of a mini video about subliminal influences toward the end of this presentation. Certain kinds of disorders of, of attention um, have to do with things such as visual neglect. Uh, for example, the tendency to ignore things on one side of the body, which is usually the left side. And this is a consequence, we think, of uh, damage to the right parietal lobe. Sometimes the symptoms include things such as reading only one side of a page, dressing one side of the body. And uh, the information from the neglected size, side does get through to some extent. It's still there. We can run tests on people who have a certain kind of a disorder. And uh, we'll notice that the information does get through, except it may not be completely at the conscious level at which uh, the information first gets processed. Something with which we uh, all have grown familiar, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, this is earmarked by different difficulties in concentration, uh, attention span for extended periods of time. Sometimes hyperactivity is in the equation. Uh, some people think that uh, the brain area is involved and that it's been overdiagnosed. Usually what happens is that uh, it's a problem that gets taken care of with certain kinds of medication, uh, particularly when it comes to reducing hyperactivity when that happens to be part of the overall diagnosis. Certain kinds of training exercises might help too, such as uh, the training exercises involved with focusing, teaching people how to actually focus on important things, building the ability to be able to uh, eliminate to some extent or filter out uh, information which is not relevant to the particular situation hand. With, with a lot of attention deficit disorder, everything is as important as everything else. And uh, truly, that's not an adaptive trait because some things, given the task at hand, uh, need to have a certain focus. Let's talk about some uh, sleeping and dreaming issues. Uh, sleep and uh, dream are very interesting concepts. What is a dream? Where does it repose? Where does it come from? Uh, how long do your dreams really take place? You know, there certainly is a standard rule that when you go into REM, that what appears to be uh, a lengthy period of time during which you might be having some kind of an adventure dream, which is, of course, my favorite dream, uh, perhaps only occurs in just a few seconds, relatively speaking, which tells you something about the nature of our, uh, if anything, internal time clock. What uh, can seem like a very long time subjectively, maybe only relatively short time, and that can work vice versa. And, and you probably experience something like this when you are anticipating an event happening. Could be a good one, could be a not so good one. Uh, perhaps a situation which you just wanted to get over with. And uh, what happens is that it seems like it's taking an eternity to reach that point. I have that when I've gone for interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, waiting for something to happen. Sometimes becoming a little bit impatient that it's not happening sooner. That uh, can be a function, to some extent in any case, of the uh, subjective sense of time that I might be experiencing at the time, which is not necessarily parallel to something we might call a more rhythmic objective sense. But what we call circadian rhythms, uh, these are activities that uh, occur throughout a day. And they are very much associated with what we call our biological clock. Biological rhythms... Uh, Superchiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus uh, is something that uh, actually serves to be related to and control that. Um, light is important uh, oftentimes with respect to those of us who are diurnal creatures in the circadian rhythm of things. Your dogs are probably diurnal just like you are. Some creatures are nocturnal and some of us who have uh, had to work night shifts uh, know that uh, sometimes it takes a bit of a uh, uh, an effort to try to readjust uh, yourself to a schedule in which you're required to work, let's say, an 11 to 7 shift. Now, it's possible to do that. People do retrain themselves, and uh, sometimes there are certain kinds of chemical uh, events that occur that can postpone uh, a successful attempt to try to adjust. And some people never make the adjustment to a night shift, by the way. Uh, I've read occasionally in what purport to be research reports about working night shifts for a long period of time that um, since it seems to be a little bit alien to the normal diurnal clock that human beings and dogs, for example, tend to keep, that over time it can actually have certain kinds of physiological effects, including shortening your lifespan. Now, how true that is, I do not know. But there have been some studies that uh, should be referenced probably in greater detail to be really scientific that have seemed to indicate that this is the case. 
You can kind of tell when you start wanting to uh, get into that wonderful state of sleep. And this is pretty average and normal for people. Uh, but uh, if you have a continuously light environment, then there is a problem with respect to getting really good sound sleep. The electroencephalograph is often used for uh, studying sleep. Uh, these are recordings that uh, can be obtained through the use of electrodes that are pasted to the scalp. And of course, that's a painless procedure. And there's a little bit of a gooey type substance that uh, is included in the suction cup-like activity of an electrode put upon one's pate. Uh, what uh, electrodes do is, ch is uh, detect changes in the electrical potentials of brain cells. And we studied that a little bit with neurons. And uh, this is often recorded on something that used to be called an oscilloscope with a sine wave. And uh, the average, so to speak, nomenclature for this, the vernacular, brain waves. Electroencephalograph recordings reveal regular cyclic changes in brain activity during sleep. And consequently, we come up with this idea. And I would like you to run it through your own particular experience to determine whether or not you think that it, uh, it, it's really true. Stage one is where we have what we call theta waves. Uh, and this is where you have light sleep, and uh, it might be even possible that you're only semi-awake. I find that to be, uh, the theta state, a fairly um, comfortable place to be, provided, of course, you don't happen to be driving. You don't want to drive, uh, it would seem to me, and your driving would not be too terribly successful. It would be counterproductive to be in the theta state uh, while driving. But, you know, if you're sitting there zoning out, as we say, in front of the meaningless uh, epic on the television set, this might be a place where a lot of people actually want to be. Uh, stage two, um, what we call sleep spindles and K-complexes. A person is asleep, might be responding to some events such as noises. So you see, there is a kind of a overlapping border there. The person is asleep. And between stage two and possibly stage one is where we have something that uh, might be called hypnosis that could be taking place. Person seems to be asleep, can be put asleep. Uh, with uh, certain kinds of suggestions uh, that are made by uh, the individual that is conducting the hypnotic uh, session. Stage three and stage four uh, is where we have a delta activity. That's very deep sleep, and uh, you're pretty much out of it. Some of us get into that quickly. Some of us take a while to get into it. And, of course, uh, some, some of us uh, who get into a very, very deep sleep cannot be roused uh, that quickly. And that sometimes can seem to be, to the person who's attempting to rouse the individuals to sleep, a little bit troublesome. I don't know if you've ever encountered somebody, a child or a relative or perhaps a friend or who knows. Uh, you're on a camping trip and, um, you know, the person in a tent with you goes into a very deep sleep and they just refuse to wake up. Sometimes uh, it can be a little bit troubling if a person gets into deep, deep sleep. But then that can also be very restful for the individual in question. Here you have the kinds of uh, ac brain activity based upon the electroencephalographic readings associated with wakefulness, uh, the drowsy, relaxed state. Notice how the sine wave begins to shift there. And um, theta waves. Notice again the difference, difference in frequency and intensity. Uh, this is a, called a sleep spindle. K-complexes are where you have some spikes in the what is called a sine wave as presented on a kind of an oscilloscope type device that uh, allows you to be able to represent uh, what's going on in the brain. Uh, slow wave sleep is that activity in which you have the delta state, very calm, very regular. Uh, you might uh, argue that, uh, you know, the difference between pitch here uh, and intensity sugge is suggestive of how deep the sleep actually is. And that is uh, typically associated, by the way, with dreamlessness. And then when you get to REM, rapid eye motion sleep, then you have uh, something that looks more like, interestingly enough, what we call a wakeful state. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, there have been some ancient uh, traditions, particularly in Hinduism, based upon some of my studies of that tradition, that uh, do a very good job trying to identify these various areas. But they put a slightly metaphysical interpretation on this sort of thing. This is why REM sleep seems to be so similar to wakefulness. It could almost be argued it's another uh, layer, so to speak, of reality that a person penetrates into uh, as they fall out of the uh, wakefulness uh, or uh, get out of the wakeful state, which is where you think of yourself as being connected to the external world with all your senses. Uh, 
But then you go into REM and you've got at least similar brain states. So as you know, you can have a very vivid dream, like a flying dream uh, where all of a sudden you realize you shouldn't be flying. But uh, you can have dreams where very elaborate kinds of scripts are worked out. Now, some argue that what a dream is is basically a recounting, once you get into REM sleep, of your day's activities. I, I don't personally believe that that's only what a dream is. Uh, I don't think it just simply is a review in, let us say, metaphorical form of what happened during your day. I think it can be about a variety of other things, but it's an interesting point. Normally, rapid eye movement uh, sleep, REM, begins 70, 90 minutes into the sleep cycle. Uh, increased heart rate, darting eyes, twitching. So you see some of the things that are happening to you physically, and you've probably seen this even in your animals, like your pets, particularly dogs. My dog, uh, I've uh, sent you pictures of uh, one of my dogs at some point in time. Uh, my golden retriever sometimes goes into an REM sleep, goes from snoring to REM, and... Uh, eyes begin to, eyelids begin to move, paws begin to move. Uh, you know, we human beings think that they're probably chasing something in their dreams, so clearly other creatures exhibit certain kinds of behavior which reminds one of what uh, occurs with human beings. Again, the EEG uh, shows that there's a resemblance in terms of uh, brain activity uh, between sleep and the waking state. And uh, those people who are awakened during REM, uh, do say that they're they're dreaming. So I would recommend that what you do, by the way, if you don't do it already, is when you do have that nice uh, dreaming episode, and a good REM and a good dream. I had one the other night. I can share it. It was a pretty good dream about a device that could be used uh, to be able to, let's say you're on a hike, um, coordinate like a GPS device where you are with a narrative about what the environment is like. Totally automated. Now, being into a kind of a John Muir or Henry David Thoreau sort of perspective on life, I like to think, the use of that kind of technology is very anti what I'd probably recommend doing. I think we should be close to nature and not let the technology interfere. But anyway, this dream was so vivid that upon awakening from it, I thought about it, went back to sleep and dreamt it again, or at least continued an episode. Now that one was probably based to some extent on an experience I had at my friend's house, who uh, he and his wife invited me to stay just the other night, of their very fancy remote control device. It's the fanciest remote control device I've ever seen, a universal remote that's got an LCD screen on it that uh, uh, is able, apparently, to manipulate quite a few appliances. And uh, after having had that experience, I promptly dreamt a scenario for it. So that's one case in which my REM dream state was really kind of a reportage with uh, some fictional elements added of my experience of that remote control. But you uh, ought to chart your dreams. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go through and, and keep that dream notebook. Uh, in the, the sleep cycle, we cycle through stages uh, four, four to five times a night. REM comes and goes. Uh, the cycles last about 90 minutes. And uh, it can vary, uh, you know, the time that is involved, the duration. But REM tends to dominate later, space, uh, later stages, especially just before waking. So if you go through the standard uh, seven or eight hours of sleep a night, some of you probably don't get that much, but we probably all should get about eight hours. I usually don't. Every now and then I do, but I usually don't. But uh, your propensity to tell something ab about a dream or to experience, to have experienced a dream or to report it to somebody else occurs almost upon uh, awakening. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go a full eight hours uh, up until the last five minutes to get REM and have that dream. Uh, you could be getting into REM during one of the cycles mentioned here and wake up from it. If you have a really interesting dream, I think it's a good idea to get up and write a note or two about it so you can remember it because you probably had the experience of having a good dream, waking up with the idea that it was a good dream. Five minutes later, you can't remember it. Maybe, maybe uh, two days later, you can. And the other thing I'd like you to think about, too, is the degree to which dreams can actually influence your life. Have you not had a dream that you will always remember? Um, you might put a, an interpretation on it that perhaps has not that much to do with the dream itself, but you'll remember having had an experience, it's a dream. Um, I've had a couple of those that changed, in a way, my perspective to the degree that it changed a little bit about my attitude towards my life. And they're fairly positive dreams.
when that happens. Uh, we don't know exactly why we sleep. We um, know that the brain, of course, does need to kind of relax and uh, have a protein and nutritional requirement and get plenty of rest. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem as though, given the fact you have REM, for example, uh, and, and your brain is very busy during a period of time, several times potentially throughout the night, you know, it's burning calories. So it's not necessarily the case that we go into sleep as a kind of a hibernation state in order to save energy. But it could be that uh, it is a time during which we repair, restore. Um, it could be, but I don't think that's been proved. And uh, it also could be because we're so uh, diurnal, meaning that we function during the day, that uh, nighttime is not good for us because we are creatures of the light. Even though you might have some night owls amongst you, we are creatures of the light. So uh, for those predators who are nocturnal, that puts us at a distinct disadvantage. So possibly the need to have sleep, get tired, is a protective mechanism, uh, courtesy of evolution or nature, that uh, essentially is giving us uh, the idea that what we need to do is find a safe, secure place while these night creatures are roaming about attempting to find food, and we may be uh, on that menu. We don't want that to happen. This is a chart showing uh, hours of sleep for various creatures. Um, look how much the opossum has to get, your cat, raccoon. Um, now, it's interesting to me that the chart does not include a dog, and uh, we have the fox. You know, look how little uh, sleep is required from some of these animals that can actually sleep on their feet. Human beings are, you know, kind of at the lower end when you think about it of need, but uh, creatures do sleep or hibernate, go into some kind of a state. But uh, I would think that your dog is not unlike uh, you are, but probably closer to a, probably closer to a raccoon. Uh, dogs can doze throughout the day and also sleep with you at night, as I'm sure anybody who's close to their pet knows. Dog wants to get up on bed with you, and for those of us who let that happen, and we spoil them, as some people would argue, it's not a big problem as far as I'm concerned, but, uh, you know, dog will sleep at the foot of the bed, dog will sleep on the bed. But at the crack of dawn, your dog is generally what will wake you up. So a dog can get a good eight hours, and in addition to that, take several naps throughout the day. Lucky dogs. What happens as a consequence of sleep deprivation? In humans, uh, sleep depri deprivation hurts virtually all aspects of functioning. Uh, complex tasks uh, are eroded. People have tried and tried and tried to come up with solutions to this. Uh, tests have been conducted in the military and elsewhere. Uh, you know, pilots uh, that are on missions, often uh, lengthy missions, uh, can suffer certain kinds of uh, hardship. Sometimes, you know, the uh, idea about UFOs has been attributed to sleep deprivation where people begin to hallucinate it does start to happen fairly quickly after you you haven't gotten sleep if you go 16 hours to 24 hours without rest or sleep but uh, that's when things begin to happen you uh, start your functionality so to speak becomes inhibited it's certainly not in your best interest from an evolutionary or survival point of view to uh, endure too much sleep deprivation and uh, what happens with animals is that uh, their internal functions become uh, awry, so to speak, they go awry. Uh, it could be so severe that even death may result. Uh, what is the function of REM and dreaming? Um, if you lose some REM one night, you might, uh, almost like the laws of conservation, mass, and energy, pick it up the next time around and uh, involve yourself in what is known as REM rebound. Sometimes uh, when you're talking about the symbolic function of dreams, uh, according to the traditional view, which is often associated with people like Freud, and I'm sure Jung would have to be mentioned there, his pupil who had some issues with main Freudianism and uh, spread out on his own to produce a Jungian archetypal psychology, but nevertheless it's Freudian uh, in its uh, character, uh, has to do with wish fulfillment, dreaming. So um, what that means is, is that you have your dream, uh, your unconscious wishes uh, tend to come to the fore of your REM state. Now think about it for just a moment. When you've actually uh, encountered REM, um, I think it would. this is why, again, it would be a good idea to kind of record some of your dreams on occasion, even if you only do it in a paragraph. 
uh, and uh, then try to go back to sleep. The problem is sometimes when people record their dreams, then they're all awake and they want to get back to sleep. So it's a trade-off there. But the next day when you're looking over your dream or the, after a couple of days, you might uh, try to determine whether or not it does seem to be wish fulfillment. Uh, dreams are symbolic. Dreams have certain scripts associated with them. Dreams are perhaps some, sometimes about uh, uniting with somebody that you've always wanted to have some intimacy with, uh, never in your waking state, but possibly in your dream. You've probably had those kinds of dreams before. Is that wish fulfillment? Uh, when they're not violent, they can be uh, actually fairly friendly encounters with the dream world and the dream characters. There are some people, I should mention, that believe that what you should try to do is have what is called a lucid dream, and uh, we have briefly mentioned that concept before. What is a lucid dream? Uh, that's a dream in which you become aware of the fact that you are dreaming, and because you become aware of that fact, you tend to be in a position of greater control of what's going on in the dream. So that's where you can say, hey, you know, I'm dreaming. I think I'll fly, uh, or other things. Sometimes I think that uh, for those people who have been taking ethics courses, you would know the famous story of Gyges, G-Y-G-E-S, where Gyges' ring is kind of like a, a form of wish fulfillment out of the ancient mythology as reported by Plato. Um, there's little evidence that is suggested for the view about, uh, about dreaming, but uh, certainly Freudian types, neo-Freudians, people who have a Freudian uh, sort of perspective like Jung, uh, think that dreams are maybe a connection to some extent to something far more universal and that it is through dreams that we learn perhaps uh, of, of archetypes, archetypal things like love uh, and uh, other ideas that uh, are innate or inherent and are revealed to us in our dreams. At that point it does become a little bit mystical sounding and while there may not be that much evidence for the idea of uh, dreams manifesting what's called here latent content, um, I think that there's some something that's worth exploring there. Other views about dreams, what is called the activation synthesis hypothesis. Uh, dreams manifest the brain's attempt to make sense of random patterns of neural activity. It's just simply going on there. So uh, you might have uh, certain kinds of patterns of neural activity which are paralleled with the uh, incidents or events, figuratively speaking, taking place in your dream. There are certain physiological uh, effects that are associated with uh, REM, for example, and so this helps to connect the idea that there's a physical substrate for dreams. Dreams help you problem solve. They might even help, help you go through a practice session with respect to uh, trying to avoid some or overcome some potential disaster or tragedy that might occur. Now, again, I don't like to share too terribly much about myself, but I think it's probably a good idea to disclose some things. In this sense in which uh, you can practice a response to threats from the environment. I had a dream, I remember, uh, before my father passed away, about two years before he passed away, in which uh, he and I were hiking, and uh, I would stop periodically, and every time I stopped maybe to take a drink of water, I would look ahead, and I noticed my father was 10 feet ahead, and then the next time 20 feet ahead, and the next time 30 feet ahead of me, and the very last time, before I woke up in a cold sweat, uh, I saw my father... Uh, his shadowy silhouette on a kind of cienega on a trail that we were on, and then I saw him disappear beyond the horizon. I woke up in a cold sweat, but I do think on in retrospect that that was almost like a practice response to a threat. You know, I, I uh, had a probably deep uh, semi-conscious or unconscious fear about my father dying, and the dream prepared me for that about two or so years before he actually passed away. And I have to tell you, at the time in which I had the dream, based on my best recollection, my father was not suffering from any uh, diagnosed, diagnosed ailment. So I was not consciously aware of any problem. I unconsciously was preparing myself for that, I think. I think that is a very interesting interpretation. Perhaps some of you have experienced that too. What is called dysomnia, disorder of sleep. Uh, this has to do with amount of sleep, timing, and quality of sleep. Uh, some of you have insomnia, um, and that's, that has to do with, for one reason or another, a difficulty in initiating or maintaining a sleep. Uh, hypersomnia is excessive sleepiness. 
And narcolepsy is a real uh, strange, I think, but uh, not too common, but but uh, enough to the point where you know we do hear of narco narcoleptics periodically, uh, but interesting to conduct a study into. I think that that would be a promising field, very fascinating to study, narcolepsy and possibly hypersomnia or even insomnia. I mean, insomnia plagues quite a few people. 30% uh, is probably a slightly conservative estimate, to be honest with you. Uh, it might be closer to 40% or so people that are plagued at one point in time or another or chronically uh, by insomnia. Now think about the reasons why you don't sleep well. Uh, you can't get your mind uh, off of some event that took place or that you're worried about. Uh, could be bills you have to pay, could be the IRS, could be uh, several things that uh, could bug you. Any of those can affect my sleeping. Could be the tune that you just heard that you can't get out of your head. Have you ever had, had that one happen to you? Where you're thinking about um, a tune and for some reason, no matter what you do, you can't get it out of your head. That has caused me insomnia, and I have to tell you, the, the, a case in point was somebody lent me, for some strange reason, while I was doing one of my extensive drives, a Hall and Oates uh, DVD, no, CD. Uh, I have heard Hall and Oates in the background uh, for many years, but I never really thought too terribly much about their music. It, it's, it's easy listening music. A couple of the tunes on that, uh, that CD, after I played them a couple of times, plagued me for two weeks. They were ringing through my head, causing me insomnia. So again, don't like to share too much, but I'll go ahead and share that, maybe to encourage you to think about some of these things that might happen to you. Parasomnias. These are abnormal disturbances like nightmares, very frightening dreams that occur, night terrors, and uh, all of a sudden a person wakes up uh, with uh, palpitations and uh, profusion of uh, sweat beads on one's forehead, sleepwalking. Some of you probably know people who do sleepwalk. Uh, that, that uh, to me, again, is another fascinating thing that could be studied, I think, in more detail. And um, it tends to happen with younger people, I suppose you might say, relatively speaking, not so much uh, with the older. A lot of children have sleepwalking incidents. And uh, it's not what you call, quote-unquote, abnormal. But uh, what, of course, can happen to a sleepwalker is that they could get themselves into a nasty situation, maybe, by tripping over something. Uh, there have been cases where people have sleptwalked out onto a ledge. Um, I think it would be a horror story to sleepwalk while you're on a cruise ship and fall off the, the uh, high railing into the dark, silent, cold ocean below. I've had dreams about that. I guess you call that a nightmare, but think about it. How often do you have nightmares? How often do you have really good dreams? How often do you have dreams that prepare you for that event? Um, dreams are a fascinating subject of uh, discussion and discourse. They've been studied by mythologists, by philosophers, and by psychologists for a long time. What about psychoactive drugs? These are drugs that affect uh, behavior, mental processes, through alterations of conscious awareness. And uh, what they do is change the communication channels of neurons. They uh, are especially relevant because they can mimic neurotransmitter chemical uh, composition. Nicotine is a case in point. It may depress and block the action of neurotransmitters. And um, what happens is uh, they can put you into a kind of a, a, a state in which you find yourself uh, needing nicotine or some kind of additive. Uh, this may explain why there is a, a, a thought that uh, nicotine is addictive and consequently, not unlike uh, you know some other harsher psychoactive drugs, a person develops a need for it and can't quit the habit. Repeated uh, use of psychoactive drugs, what, what happens? Now we've seen unfortunately a couple of cases in which this probably happened with some celebrities over the past couple of years taking all sorts of prescription drugs in addition to the psychoactive drugs that uh, you know cause uh, certain kinds of uh, issues to occur with regard to neurotransmitters. A tolerance develops. Your body physically adapts to compensate for the continued use. And then it becomes necessary to increase the amounts in order to produce the same effects. This is a problem with things like cocaine. Uh, having been in uh, drug uh, counseling sessions where I have uh, tutored uh, people um, uh, in the jail system, and uh, in the juvenile system about uh, their use of, uh, of drugs and the woes and 
um, the uh, non-benefits of use, you find that something like cocaine is probably for many early users, if not most of them, uh, the best experience a person has, it is alleged, with the first uh, inhalation or exposure to cocaine is the best one. The first is the best. Uh, this is not only true of some psychoactive drugs, it's also true of other kinds of activities that persons uh, undertake for the first time, and I think that may have to do with uh, endorphins and uh, possibly other uh, you know, chemicals that uh, have to do with uh, neurotransmission. Uh, maybe your first uh, you know, romance is the best, perhaps your first uh, good movie. You see it again, you're hoping for the same high that you got the first time around. Uh, cocaine is very severe in that respect, and it's uh, kind of like the, I guess for some, the drug that appears to be uh, uh, have great promise for them, and it just very much misleads. The uh, harsh irony is the fact that it takes more and more of a drug like that to try to achieve the same effect, and you probably never do achieve the same effect. It becomes a very vicious kind of undertaking. Drug dependency can occur. That's a condition in which individuals experience physical or psychological need of the drug, or both. And if it's physical dependency, then when you withdraw the drug, what can happen is that withdrawal can occur. And uh, then, uh, of course, there are people that go into very serious, uh, almost uh, convulsive states when they become physically dependent on drugs and the drug is removed. What are some categories? Uh, we're all pretty much uh, at this point in time familiar with depressants and stimulants and what they do. Uh, but depressants, of course, slow the activity of the CNS. And uh, examples of this are alcohol, barbiturates, tranquilizers. This is what people do in order to achieve some kind of a calm. Uh, this is, I think, one of the main sources of uh, overuse, um, overindulgence. Uh, the depressant uh, produces a feeling of uh, false sense of security at times, calmness. People seek after that, particularly if they're trying to uh, calm themselves after a busy day, a stressful day. Stimulants do just the opposite, increase the activity of CNS. And boy, one of my, one of my favorites, of course, is caffeine. I'm not too much into at all nicotine and none of the rest of these, of course, for me personally. But some of you may have had a direct or indirect experience with amphetamines and other things. But uh, caffeine is my drug of choice and an occasional cigar. So I suppose those are my two stimulants. Uh, further categories, uh, opiates, uh, depressed central nervous system activity. Uh, they also reduce pain. That's, again, why people like them. False sense of security through euphoria, opium, heroin, morphine, cases in point. Hallucinogens, hallucinogenic drugs affect perception, distort reality. And uh, examples, of course, are LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, marijuana. Uh, there are different uh, effects that the different people feel based upon a constitution and their mood. Uh, in some instances, a drug uh, of choice might uh, induce euphoria in a person, and another might cause a phobia. Uh, the setting in which a drug is taken, the past experience a person has with the drug, can set up certain kinds of expectations that could be negative or positive. And, of course, your physical or psychological state that you're in can all relate to the psychological factors that uh, are the factors that are involved in what occurs to a person who takes hallucinogenic drugs. And we'll end it there and we'll resume our discussion when we meet again on hypnosis.